Junkbot and Junkbot Undercover are, or were, puzzle games on lego.com, two of that website's numerous free flash games to which I dedicated many hours of my childhood. These early titles from Game Lab came out in 2001 and 2003 respectively. As simple as they appear to be, Junkbot and Junkbot Undercover played an outsized part in my creative development. In particular, I owe the art directors Peter Lee and Frank Lance for the gray, grungy factories full of dripping pipes, computer consoles, and signs reading NO ACCESS, as well as Junkbot's hilarious deadpan expression and shifty eyes. When I first began writing stories as a child, my material initially derived from Junkbot. This is the origin of the Junk Robo character in the Two Paper Wad series I hope to begin serializing online at twopaperwads.com, but I'm still trying to figure out the best format for it. In recognition of what I owe the Junkbot duology, I've decided to honor the working class robot with this video, rather lazily adapted from a post on my website, macrophones.com. I haven't exactly promoted this, but you can read some of my original writing there. Oh, Junkbot's gonna chow down, he's gonna do it. Oh, there he's doing it. Junkbot opens on the titular bot in a quaint room complete with a needlepoint reading I love trash, becoming worried when he runs out of rubbish to dump down the literal hatch on his dumpster-like head. Oh, but the help wanted section of the newspaper has answers. He finds a janitorial position at this shadowy building, what I, as a kid, interpreted as the garbage factory. The job involves walking room to room and eating recycling bins exclusively filled with paper wads. The title screen doubles as a tutorial to get you used to the controls. Bossbot, a totally inhuman eyebot in a silly necktie, gives Junkbot his assignment in a letter striped green and white like the output of an old dot matrix printer, and the game begins. Each level is a single screen, completed when Junkbot reaches every blue trash can and crushes the bin into his head. He might somehow recycle them, judging from the emblem on his side. The player does not control Junkbot, who marches forward until he bumps into a barrier or pit, at which point he pivots with a satisfying squeak to march in the opposite direction. Junkbot can climb the height of one brick at a time and cross gaps one stud wide. This concept has precedence in Lemmings, and even something more obscure like Game Freak's Mario and Wario. But those games offer pretexts for their main character's helplessness. The misconception of Lemmings as suicidally oblivious migrators, and the bucket Wario crams over Mario's head. What's Junkbot's excuse? Beats me, but here on Mackerel Phones we ask the tough questions. Junkbot's primary enemies are Gearbots and, later in the game, their kin the Climbots, Flybots, and iBots, all of which follow simple movement patterns. Gearbots move side to side like Junkbot, though cannot clear even a one stud gap. Climbots move side to side, but are capable of climbing four bricks height if they reach a wall. Flybots behave the same as Gearbots, except airborne. iBots, the most dangerous, are initially like Flybots, but break their patrols if Junkbot enters their line of sight, chasing the poor janitor until he's taken out or they ram into a barrier. Ibots can't move diagonally. Like every other obstacle, these enemy bots kill Junkbot in one hit, or at least cause him to lose his color and assume a dejected expression, complete with a funny little statement like, I hate Mondays. As a child, the Ibots frighten me, mainly due to the shrill ringing they emit if they spot Junkbot, and their namesake eye bright red hunt him down. Level 4-7, featuring two Ibots pinned in, is called Don't Let the Dogs Out. So Game Lab knew the iBots behave like fierce guard animals waiting to pounce, their sharp-toothed mouths barking through the prison bars. Or gears spinning through the gap in the bricks, whichever. Run, Junkbot, run! The iBots see you! But Junkbot never picks up the pace, no matter what. Level 4-5 running the gauntlet is rather nerve-wracking. How can Junkbot survive his shift? Part of this strategy is a core aspect of Junkbot's personality. He does not give a frick. I'm censoring myself because this isn't an R-rated video. Nothing phases Junkbot, which is essential to avoid being so stressed out he can't perform his job. But he couldn't do it without the player. To help him survive and eat trash, and then I start eating garbage, we use the mouse cursor to move Lego bricks, whose bright colors distinguish them from the otherwise gray and dark stages to allow Junkbot to clear gaps and dodge obstacles. When clicked to be moved, the bricks become intangible until the player sets them down somewhere. 
so those ghostly bricks you see moving around, I'm moving with my cursor. Every one of these enemy bots receives a level to shine. For example, Building 3 Level 3, It's Raining Climb Bots, features all of these climb bots in a sort of net made of bricks. But in order to build a bridge to get Junk Bot to that delicious trash can, you're going to have to let them out. The trick here is to make sure the climb bots end up stuck under the bridge that you build for our orange janitor hero. Well, hero might not be the right word, but hey, jobs don't have to be heroic to be worth doing. In addition to the enemy bots, there are other environmental hazards, including dangerous heated grills, wind tunnel force fans that blow junk bot into the air until he hits the ceiling or a brick, and movable bounce pads that spring junk bot about five studs forward. While blasted against the roof, Junkbot continues moving his legs at the same pace as ever. Like I said, Junkbot does not give a flip. Duh, not cussing makes me sound ridiculous. This is horrible. <laughs> um. Bricks can block the airflow, and so can the enemy bots. This is, in fact, the key to level 3-6, Windy Bridge, which is one of the trickier ones. Some of these stages I know how to complete right away, but Windy Bridge forces me to guess every time. Something about it just doesn't stick in my memory. Junkbot is fair and consistent, as puzzles should be. If you lose, you're not angry, because it's your fault, not the game's. The notable exception is level 412 The Quest, where the dripping water took out Junkbot on multiple attempts, despite my having collected the armor that colors him an appealing eggshell blue and enables him to take one hit without a game over. Luck and puzzles go together about as well as mustard and Lego bricks, but this is clearly a mistake rather than a deliberate slight from Game Lab. Each of the four buildings has 15 levels, and each completed level awards a keycard. Once Junkbot attains 10 keycards from one building, he can unlock the next. Building 4 shows a lock icon on the 10th keycard, the same as the previous three, but the player receives no reward for reaching this number. Junkbot has no ending, but I would call collecting 10 Building 4 keycards the win state. For those players like me who want some additional challenges for 100% completion, there are not only the 20 functionally extra levels, the player receives a gold award for clearing each level under a certain predetermined number of moves. While some gold award conditions offer wiggle room, others demand the player not waste a single click. Despite the Christmas theme, Level 310's Gold Award is no gift. It's one of the trickiest in the game. Attaining Gold Awards allows Junkbot to rise through the ranks. For example, at 40 Gold Awards, Junkbot becomes Employee of the Year. I like how the Employee of the Year placard is bolted onto the wall, like all the hazard warning signs, rather than hanging in a frame or something. Since the player doesn't need to complete every level, if they get stuck on any in particular, they can hop to another rather than have more fun gated off behind some insurmountable challenge. I appreciate a video game that offers some leeway, as while hardly thrilling, some of the toughest video games there are fall into the puzzle genre. For the little kids who constituted the target demographic, it's a thoughtful touch. For an adult, not especially. Junkbot is by no means hard. Except for level 2-9 trapped in the freezer. Brrrr. Why are there four trash bins in the freezer? In my experience, walk-in freezers contain zero trash bins. Usually an in-and-out kind of deal. Like every other video game from my childhood I returned to during the 2020 quarantine, Pac-Man World, Ms. Pac-Man Maze Madness, SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, and so on, Junkbot is a lot easier than I remembered it. A large number of the stages are not puzzles so much as tutorials. The opening four stages of 60 total, for example, purely allow the player to practice the point-and-click controls with zero risk and zero thought. The first time the game offers any challenge is Terrarium, the seventh level of Building 1. Although there are no obstacles, achieving the Gold Award requires a degree of consideration because of the ungainly brick layout. Even after Building 1, however, the game occasionally takes a break from challenge to demonstrate new mechanics, as in Level 3-1, Portable Boost. Despite these missed opportunities taking up about a whole sixth of the game, these are excellent tutorials. Terrarium, for example, forces the player to practice bridge building, a skill that will often come up in the later levels. Level 1-4, Move the Stairs, shows the player that by clicking on the bottom brick, you can move quite a few bricks all at once. This will prove essential for attaining some gold awards.
Level 1-8 Caution Leaky Roof introduces the player to leaky pipes and the idea of building a brick umbrella to keep Junkbot dry, lest he short circuit. This theme will recur in many levels. Rather than interrupt the flow of play to force the player to read an explanation of the game mechanics, Game Lab sets up situations in which the player is likely to intuitively and safely discover them, or, in one case, incorporates the writing organically into the title of the level. Don't touch the gearbots. If this method fails, the game also includes a written explanation behind the Help menu option. You might notice there's a stray red pixel in two frames of Junkbot's walking animation. What's up with that? When I fired up Junkbot Undercover again, it was exactly as tough as I remember it. The darker levels and music, topped off with atmospheric water dripping and computer blooping sound effects, complement the higher challenge. It's a shame that Junkbot's second outing seems to be less well-remembered than his first, as Undercover is the superior game. Uh, oh, it's a nice touch in this level how the skull and crossbones danger sign has been repurposed into a Jolly Roger flag for the Gearbot's pirate ship. The folks at Game Lab already had Junkbot experience in their collective pockets and operated on the old-school video game ethos that if you're playing the sequel, you're great at the original. While by no means soul-crushingly hard like a really old-school computer game, Undercover definitely hues more difficult. I never beat it as a kid. If the player runs through each level in order, Undercover has, by level 10 of 61, introduced all the enemies and obstacles its predecessor offered in its entire 60 levels. Every mechanic is in the air from the get-go, and they never let up. Undercover resembles an expansion pack for the original, continuing where the first literally left off, with Junkbot venturing into the basement of Building 4. Junkbot feels incomplete without Undercover's further explorations of the game mechanics and conclusive ending. Yeah, an actual ending this time. Building on this higher baseline complexity are Undercover's new ideas, such as crates that Junkbot can push with his face, but on top of which the player cannot build. This is simple enough in level 1-4. The trick here is noticing the pre-built staircase growing from the central blue flower pot. But in level 2-8, push comes to shove, maneuvering around and over the crates becomes much trickier. Another new mechanic introduced in Area 3 are teleporters that warp Junkbot to other parts of the screen. These can be fiendish, forming the basis of the maze in level 3-7, Quantum Roulette. I might have named it Russian Roulette, given the two teleporters that drop Junkbot into deadly lasers. Which are the lethal teleporters? The player can discover the answer only through trial and error. The Gold Award challenge caused parts of Undercover to bedevil even my adult self, with Quantum Roulette, along with levels 3-6, The Abandoned Coaster, and level 4-5, Central Database, taking me about 40 minutes each. The Abandoned Coaster is one of the few levels that I remembered specifically after so many years, if not how to clear it. A cobweb-covered railway in some kind of secret research facility in a cave was an evocative image to me as a kid. With the exception of levels 1-1, 1-2, 2-1, and probably some others that I forget, even Undercover's introductory tutorial stages feature a higher degree of challenge. With level 2-1 Laser Lab, the lack of difficulty feels like a missed opportunity, as level 2-12 Return to Laser Lab is nearly identical, yet much trickier. Overall, Undercover is cleverer and more confident than the previous Junkbot adventure. The introductory cutscene is funnier, too, with somewhat more interesting animation. The plot this time is that Junkbot picks up a top-secret envelope the Gearbots drop, labeled Project X. Inside he finds a scrap of paper that reads, Don't tell Junkbot about, before being torn off. Junkbot won't take that lying down. He orders a home spy kit online to dig into the company's secrets, accounting for Undercover's goofy spy theme. Junkbot as a paranoiac is not a huge leap from his shifty eyes and tendency to always look behind him, as if over a non-existent shoulder. The new letter from Bossbot does a poor job of allaying Junkbot's concerns. There are no secret underground areas, and I don't want you sneaking into them! 
There are no further cutscenes until the ending, but based on the levels themselves, Junkbot ventures through subterranean factory floors, then into caverns full of cobwebs and mold. His descent closes in the spotless white secret laboratory, full of recycling bins animated with artificial intelligence. The AI trash cans can run, but they can't hide. This is the other core component of Junkbot's personality. He never gives up. The level titles are darker too. They're a delight and suggest pulpy action. 1-6 Elementary, Sherlock Holmes. 2-9 Crawling Through Vents. 2-14 The Chamber of Death. 3-13 Locked Room Mystery. 4-2 Mobile Suit. 4-12 The Reactor Core. I choose to interpret level 2-2 Breakout as a reference to the Atari game. Some of them are even kinda highfalutin, like 213, no exit. Sartre said hell is other people, but in this case, I think hell is the deadly flybot. The twist comes when there's an Area 5 consisting of one level, Project X. The secret plan is apparently just a climbot and an iBot, though the level nonetheless proves heckin' tricky. The end cutscene reveals that, instead of these two killer robots, the actual Project X is a surprise party for Junkbot. This is entering sitcom levels of wacky. The Gearbots owe him this much, I suppose, for cleaning the buildings, despite their efforts to kill him. But the camera zooms in on one Gearbot holding a folder marked Project Y, transitioning to a question mark before dumping the player back to the menu. Undercover preserves some mystery in the world. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how do I play Junkbot? I want to play Junkbot again! Well, I got this footage using my time machine, but if you want to play it now, my recommendation is Blue Maxima's Flashpoint, a massive flash preservation project with thousands of games and animations, including Junkbot and Junkbot Undercover. It's an amazing operation that has saved so, so many video games. I suggest downloading Flashpoint Infinity, as the alternative, Flashpoint Ultimate, involves downloading all the Flash media simultaneously, demanding more than 400 gigabytes of storage. Next, type Junkbot into the Infinity search bar and click the Junkbot game's icons to download and open them. Though I didn't get Junkbot Undercover's save feature to work, so be careful. You can also find Crystalian Conflict, LEGO Studios Backlot, and pretty much any other LEGO game in there, too. Bonus! Be aware that Flashpoint is dedicated to preserving all Flash media, including porn. Which, depending on your attitude, might also be a bonus. So, Flashpoint has an option to turn off extreme content. I'll post a link to Flashpoint in the description. There is also a LEGO Club-specific preservation operation called Project Brick. Based on my experience, this method is more complicated and less reliable. To play the games properly, you have to set up a local server, for example. So I advise against it. I'm not sure which of the many Project Brick archives contain Junkbot, though. I'll post a link to Project Brick in the video description, too. Oh, yeah. There is no surprise in Junkbot and Junkbot Undercover being light on story, but it is surprising that they actually don't tie into any LEGO theme. LEGO's never released a Junkbot kit. Unlike other old LEGO icons like Rock Raiders or, well, Luke Skywalker, Junkbot was not an established toy character. That alone would be enough to distinguish him among the LEGO Club games, but the simple yet fleshed out gameplay and catchy music definitely helped. It's fitting enough that Junkbot loves trash, because in a way, media like this is trash. And I love it. Many other trash video games I played in my early childhood affected my ways of thinking and my artistic sensibilities. What sets Junkbot apart is the degree to which it affected me. Junkbot-related fiction isn't the first I produced as a little kid, but my most robust series of the time, the characters that I returned to most certainly were. I began by drawing pictures of Junkbot engaging in various activities, and eventually wrote a little book called Two Happy Paper Wads, 
that starred two living paper wads who used a string to escape their trash can when Junkbot picked it up to process as in the game. I suppose I realized that Junkbot was rather scary from the perspective of those animated AI trash cans whom he murders in cold blood. Terrifying. After that, I wrote dozens and dozens of wordless books about these two characters, expanding the world they lived in to slapstick life. Though the robot himself rapidly became a minor character, I never forgot about where it all began. This was also the reason I attempted to make many characters resemble LEGO minifigures. If asked, I would have suggested playing Junkbot and Junkbot Undercover as a necessary primer for my books. Given the early stage of my artistic output these stories constitute, Junkbot is, unlikely as it sounds, foundational to my writing. On one level, it's a case of whatever I happen to have been exposed to influencing the putty-like mind of little kid me. But I think there's something to Junkbot. After all, SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom might have been a top-notch platformer, but I didn't write a single book based on it. Or rather, I did, but it was my spin on the premise villain's robot army gets out of his control, rather than borrowing the characters or any specifics. The minimal storytelling of Junkbot unintentionally opens ample space for creativity. I like to imagine that Junkbot is some kind of junkie, fittingly enough, seeking his next trash fix, and his monomania leads this lowly janitor to unintentionally take over the company, represented in his title of our new president if the player attains all gold awards in the original. He's showered with paper wads as with roses. Junkbot is a rags-to-riches story. Maybe. This ending must be non-canon since Bossbot remains the president in Undercover, but that's neither here nor there. What is the player's role in the game's universe if we don't control, and hence are not Junkbot? Does Junkbot move bricks on the fly with telekinesis? After all, it's Junkbot who receives the corporate and home spy kit rewards, not the player, despite the fact that Junkbot apparently paces back and forth instead of doing any work. As a kid, I wondered what this company that hired Junkbot actually does. I assumed the buildings are factories because BossBot's memo opens with, Welcome to the factory. However, there's no sign of manufacturing beyond the smokestacks on buildings 1 and 4, and horrors like the giant green-skinned monster of Building 3's secret laboratory, level 315. No room Junkbot traverses contains industrial equipment, except Junkbot Undercover level 113 Trash Picker, and that is debatable. The Trash Picker not only might be fake, a crane made of movable Lego bricks, but would clearly move trash, not product. Where's all the trash coming from? Most likely the factory manufactures gearbots, but for what purpose? Why let them run loose through the facility? Why do many rooms seem to lack an entrance or exit? So many aspects of the setting get my brain gear spinning, imagining an alien mechanical world where obsessive weirdos like Junkbot feel at home. Whether or not Project X is a surprise party, the factory is definitely involved in shady dealings. Junkbot legitimately found secret underground labs full of experimental laser and teleportation technology. The original Junkbot's level 4-8 is called What is Project X, and features two vaguely humanoid figures made of bricks. Was the surprise party a ploy to get Junkbot off BossBot's tracks? Is Project X actually a bid to create life after all? The AI project Junkbot uncovers in Area 4 Secret Lab is less remarkable, since every character is already an AI. Perhaps this is why Project X would be so shocking. In a world of robots, the company wants to create organic life from Lego bricks. That leads me to another question. Who built the robots to begin with? The world of flat green plains surrounding the four dark perilous factory buildings might have inspired me as a kid to make the world of my stories much the same. Vast grassy wilderness with the occasional industrial complex. Not noticing the boss bot character, I intended one of my more serious recurring villains to be the owner of these factories, intuiting that the company must be some kind of arms dealer. While I doubt anyone but me understood these nuances of my silly picture books, the enthusiasm and creativity Simple Little Junkbot drew out of me is undeniable. It's a cliché, but adults really do lose something of the wonder little children can find in any random stuff. As a grown-up, I have no idea how I spent so many hours and so much thought on video games that I can now complete in a day. 
but I'm glad I spent the time doing something I enjoyed. Not like little kid me had much better to do anyway. A lot of people still like Junkbot. For example, somebody called Juxu on the website Rebrickable took the time to create a huge model of Junkbot in August of 2020. Impressive, huh? I bet that something like 100% of these Junkbot fans are people who played it as kids, the marching orange dumpster becoming the stuff of warm memories. Nostalgia apparently moves some people to tears, but not me. I don't remember childhood fondly. Still, Junkbot definitely falls into the happy memory bin. It speaks ill of the way our culture approaches technology that the only people keeping Junkbot and thousands of other Flash games alive are a few preservationists like the dedicated folks involved with Blue Maxima. Obviously, Junkbot and the vast majority of Flash games are not invaluable treasures. The average crappy novel probably contains more interesting ideas than the average crappy video game, and certainly than the average crappy Flash game. Give me the juice. Give me the cheese. But even a crappy Flash game is art, and some Flash games are more sophisticated than you might think, such as the experimental and politically radical Flash games of Mala Industria, or the surreal stop-motion art games with which Mason Lindroth of Hylix fame got started. The fact that so much video game art, both Flash and otherwise, survives only through piracy and dubiously legal fan archivists is a tragedy indicting the whole copyright and technological systems that chain us up. To quote a Mala Industria talk, Hundreds of excellent apps and games disappear every year due to forced obsolescence, unpaid membership, or certificates expiration. Backward compatibility is not a profitable endeavor, and the dependencies required by closed platforms, digital right management systems, and development environments make digital artworks extremely frail and vulnerable. All the stuff made now in Unity or Unreal is much more likely to disappear than Flash games. I'm afraid five or ten years from now, I'll have to give a similar talk about Unity games, because the two major operating systems are trying hard to control what can run on our machines by pushing you toward their own marketplaces and blocking apps by developers that don't pay shakedown money. They do so by introducing these kind of dependencies, and that's the same for platforms like Steam. The official excuse is security, but the real reason is the extraction of rent. Increased security is just a side effect of a closed system. Although obviously Junkbot isn't sophisticated or emotionally raw in the style of Natalie Lawhead's Flash creations or anything like that. How many people are there whose day would really be brightened up with a round of the game they loved as a kid, but who don't have the time or knowledge to seek out this media that LEGO thoughtlessly deleted, perhaps had to delete, after keeping it up on their site for so, so many years? In the words of the enigmatic Blue Maxima, when asked if Flashpoint is legal, The only real answer is nobody knows, and really, nobody should care. Games that more or less have a ticking clock until they die need to be saved now, as fast as possible. Damn straight. But preservation is still a huge deal. You can't! Pop cultural ephemera like Junkbot have value. Not as much as the writings of Jamaica Kincaid, granted, but still value. It's not like we can only have one or the other. My friend Skello drew my attention to the 2020 LEGO creator set 10273 Haunted House. Look who we see in these catalog photos a faceless junk bot alongside other ghosts of the past. People talk a lot about nostalgia these days, often in the context of corporations cynically wielding it to sell stuff to people burnt out on adulthood hell. An adulthood hell, largely the work of such corporations. Lego might have hopped into the nostalgia bandwagon too, hiding this blank junk bot in Haunted House alongside other early 2000s Lego references. No, this person isn't junk bot. There he is. Full disclosure, I used to be a big LEGO fan. Shocking! Even as a kid, I thought LEGO lost something when they pivoted their emphasis to licensed themes. Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Marvel, Mario, Minecraft, and who knows what else at this point. 
instead of their original properties. Even many of these original properties are derived from pop culture media, of course. The early space sets imitate Star Trek, Johnny Thunder imitates Indiana Jones, and so on. But screw Captain Jack Sparrow, I want Captain Roger Redbeard! Another instance of the increasing corporate homogenization of culture. But maybe that's nostalgia speaking after all. LEGO was always itself a corporation, out to get me addicted to little bits of plastic, and their marketing succeeded. Star Wars remained the most popular LEGO theme through my childhood. Maybe Junkbot stood out because it was not trying to sell me anything. No tie-in toys, no ads, and none of the predatory gambling microtransaction rubbish that plagues online games today. Just 121 free, fun puzzles with catchy music. In a way, LEGO.com invited me to play and build new creations with Junkbot's setting in the same way as the pieces of the LEGO group sets. The instruction booklet of the haunted house suggests Junkbot should be disassembled and in storage in the manner of Von Baron's attic. I guess that parallels the fate of Johnny Thunder and those other LEGO originals. The colors are dulled, as though Junkbot, having been shut down and tossed into a crate, was left to rust. Placing Junkbot beneath a cobweb next to a mind control device in the attic of the villainous grave robber Baron Von Baron, the instruction booklet includes some sad flavor text. A heavy, dusty box of junk. A faded sticker reads, I love trash. But the reason I love trash isn't only because of Junkbot and other trash media in which I've somehow found meaning. It's also because, if you want to phrase it harshly, the vast majority of people are trash. The vast majority of us aren't going to be famous actors, or musicians, or writers who will be remembered any longer than some Flash game. But that doesn't mean we don't deserve to be remembered. So, if Junkbot of all things could have a legacy, if someone could make an ode to Junkbot, like I have here, maybe any of us could have a legacy. Maybe someone could make an ode to any of us. That's the video. You can like and comment and subscribe and all that kind of stuff if you want. Um, or check out, again, MackerelPhones.com, where you can read the original post I based this video on, though after seeing the video you probably won't want to. There is other original writing there, though. Well, okay. Bye.